we're going to begin our discussion of international environmental politics by talking about the tragedy of the commons, which is a very useful uh, concept to understand environmental problems in general, but especially international environmental problems. And it also connects up nicely with our discussion of the prisoner's dilemma and uh, collective action problems uh, earlier in the course. So the model is straightforward and it's discussed in the textbook, so I'll review it quickly here. The idea is you have a chunk of land, and, and to be clear, the story comes from a sort of real world situation in, in uh, 18th or 19th century England. You've got a chunk of land that multiple farmers can use to graze their cattle on. It's a shared pasture. And the dynamic is that the cattle are owned by the individuals, but the pasture is shared. So uh, the benefits, whether it's in meat or milk or some combination, to ad ha having additional cattle accrue to a, an individual who owns that animal. The costs, in terms of depleting the supply of grass and the pasture, are shared by everyone. Because uh, um, when one cow eats the grass, it's not available to everybody else's. What this means, um, because the benefits accrue to one, but the costs are shared by everybody, is that each person has the incentive to put another head of cattle on. Um, and then another, and then another, until the grass is depleted or the pasture is depleted, and the number of cattle that you can sustain on that piece of land plummets. And then everybody is worse off. And that's the tragedy. And um, this might sound sort of intuitively similar to a lot of environmental problems, because it is. Um, it's also analytically virtually identical um, to the prisoner's dilemma. And here I've just represented the tragedy of, of commons as a, as, a, uh, as a version of the prisoner's dilemma. Um, the big difference between the prisoner's dilemma and the tragedy of the commons is the prisoner's dilemma we represent with only two players, whereas the tragedy of, of the commons, the way we tell the story, has multiple players. Uh, but in the real world, most collective action problems are multiplayer problems. Uh, the reason we use the two-person version of the prisoner's dilemma is simply because you can represent it in this little table so in such a nifty way, whereas once you get to multiple players, it gets impossible. Uh, but the dynamics are the same, and the dynamic is this. When everybody does what is individually rational, the collective outcome is irrational. And in this case, it's polluted skies, uh, a depleted fishery, a depleted pasture, um, and so on. Two broad solutions exist. Right? One is to privatize the commons. You divide it up so that now you've created a, 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 um, a consistency between the benefits and the costs to adding more cattle. Right Now I've just got a small piece of the pasture and if I overgraze it, then that's my problem because I can't graze my cattle on other people's lands. And so uh, by dividing the pasture up, we essentially equalize um, or, or, or force a correspondence between the costs and benefits of what happens with each uh, additional uh, head of cattle. Uh, so that's one way to do it. The other way is to regulate it, um, which is to agree on what's called uh, the maximum s sustainable yield. Uh, and that concept applies to forests, fisheries, but also to this question of a shared pasture. Um, you agree on essentially how many cattle you can graze while uh, leaving enough fresh grass growing that you can continually keep that number there, right, without it plummeting. Um, and then you have to allocate that, right? You have to say, okay, if the total number of cattle we can, we can graze on this chunk of land is 20, you're going to get five, you're going to get four, you're going to get six, and so on. Um, and then you have to, of course, monitor it for compliance. So what are the, the, um, the, the problems with these different solutions? The problems with privatizing, especially in environmental problems, is that there are some things that really can't be divided up and privatized. Uh, the air is very hard to uh, privatize because we can't right, box it up and, and, and keep it from moving around. Or we can't keep the pollution that I create from, from uh, floating into somebody else's airspace. Um, the same thing is true of rivers. The water just moves around, um, and especially oceans. There are some ways that some parts of the oceans have been privatized, and that's this notion of exclusive economic zones that have developed since the 1980s, which is uh, essentially mo most countries now say that every economic asset um, in the ocean, uh, it, up to 200 kilometers from shore, belongs to that country. And so that takes a much bigger share of the bounty of the ocean and privatizes it 
um, in terms of giving it to a particular country, and then presumably that country can, can effectively regulate what, what gets taken out of it. Um, but even that is of limited effect because the fish move around. And if the fish are moving from uh, one, uh, one uh, exclusive economic zone to the other, or moving from an exclusive economic zone out into the open ocean, there's still a big incentive to harvest as many of them as you can while you have the chance. Um, privatizing also means permanently assigning ownership, and you can imagine a lot of disagreements um, over who should get what, right? How do you allocate or privatize the commons fairly? There are problems with regulating as well. Um, one of the big problems is the first thing you have to do is agree on this maximum sustainable yield, and if the maximum sustainable yield is less than what people are pulling out of it now or the number of cattle they're grazing on it now, that means the first thing that has to happen is people have to undergo hardship because they're going to cut their harvest um, or cut their production. And that's extremely unpopular, threatens people's livelihoods, threatens communities, and so uh, they push back. And you've seen this, for example, in, um, in fisheries around the world where uh, fishers uh, pretty staunchly resist uh, cutting the number of fish that are going to get taken out of some, some area, uh, even if in the long term that's what's necessary to keep the, the business going. Because in the short term, they feel like they're going to be ruined. Um, and then there's the question of how this maximum sustainable yield should be distributed. The economists will tell you that the most efficient way to do it is through the market or through some kind of auction. And that's what happens with carbon emissions in lots of places. They agree on how much carbon can be emitted. Uh, they distribute those the carbon emissions rights and then they create a market so they can be traded. Um, and in the case of fisheries, often what happens is the rights are initially assigned to people who've been his, uh, fishing those waters historically. And of course, establishing who has been there, how much they've been getting, how much they deserve, pretty controversial stuff. And you can imagine it's very politically difficult to do. Uh, there are big incentives to cheat on this kind of regulation, to take more lobsters out of the water than you've been allocated. Um, or to catch more fish than you've been allocated, um, and, and therefore the monitoring costs on these agreements can be very, very high. I want to just briefly talk about the distinction between national and international regulation. At the national level, right, some shared fishery within the borders of a single state, think about a lake within the United States, if you have an effective government, you can regulate, right? You say, and this is true at pretty much every lake or river in the United States, you're only allowed to take out this many fish. Right? Or you're only allowed to shoot this many deer per year on this chunk of land, and so on. Um, so even though these are problems at the domestic level, domestic governments, if they're effective, have the ability to regulate. Internationally, since we don't have a government, uh, regulation is much more difficult. Right? You have to form agreements, you have to find ways of monitoring those agreements, and so on. And as we'll see, this is much, much trickier. Uh, but that really um, gets us started on, on the, the question of international environmental politics. And the reference just is there if you want it. It's a very, it's actually a scary article to read. The guy gets to some pretty bizarre uh, or, or at least frightening conclusions in his article. But there it is, published in, in Science way back in 1968.